Can we get in? Ruben represents the most dynamic social movement in the country. He is meeting with politicians who are afraid to appear in public for fear of being assaulted. They have little time to concentrate on anything but the financial crisis. But the results are few. Progress is slow. Your bill is frozen. I'm struggling to arrange for you to make your case to the Commission of Trade. But there's a lack of political will and interest. Sadly, I haven't been able to spend much time in all this because of the debates about the financial crisis. Dori Arias bounces endlessly between the banks and the courts where her lawsuit is pending. Like most Argentinians, as the child of immigrants, she has the right to a European passport, and escape is now a temptation. I'm a child of immigrants, like many other Argentinians. My parents are Spanish. My mother is 73 years old. She came here when she was 20. My mother looked me in the eye, held my hand. We were having lunch and told me, my daughter, the time has come for you to leave. Don't mind me. The time has come to leave. She said, please forgive me for having chosen this country, for not having chosen another one where you could have done better. What are you going to do when I'm gone? I don't want to think about that. Do you think you'll be better off? You may be, but I won't. But sometimes life brings about things one doesn't want. Perhaps I should take you with me. What for, to be a burden? Are you mad at Argentina, mother? No. You always loved it more than me. I'm angry with the government of our country. It could have been a great country, and now it's trash. When I came, there were jobs for everybody. There was food. Then, to me, it was a great country. You arrived here from Europe, and the country was good to us. But not anymore. It all came home to me the day I took my best friend to the airport to see him off. I realized that my best friend was leaving the country to live elsewhere. I began to cry. Argentina was stealing my friend from me. So I cried with rage, real rage. I was furious because this crisis was stealing my closest friend from me. Argentina is a land of immigrants. Now their children and grandchildren are leaving. 140,000 in the past two years, the U.S. equivalent would be over a million people.
buenas noches y bienvenidos a Recursos Good evening. Humanos. Welcome to Human Resources. Today, Oryx, a distributor of women's clothing, is looking for an assistant. But before we open today's show, I want to remind you that in our 24 past shows, the companies have filled 45 jobs. There are 45 families whose lives have changed since they went back to work. Now I'm proud to introduce to you the contestants. Samantha Bologna Pires, 24 years old, single, she has a child. And Mariela Alejandra Amaya, 21, single, she has seven brothers and sisters. What was your last job? I was an assistant. What happened? The firm collapsed. And you were out on the streets? Yes. When she had a job, she used to take me places. Now we can't go anywhere. I want you to stop being sad. I don't like you being sad. I love you, Mom. Muchas gracias. Now I am going on to meet Mariela Amaya. How are you? Now, let's get to know you a little bit more. Is that okay with you? No, no, no problem. When I'm upset, I go to my older sister, Mariela, for advice. She knows how to help me. They always confide in me. I'm more than a sister. I'm sort of a second mother. Being all stuck together unites them. What a good family you have, Pedro. I am lucky. A life of sacrifice. But they are very well brought up. I hope so. Can we have the results of the phone-in? Girls, the moment of truth. Let's see. Mariela Samantha. Who does the audience choose to win the job as sales clerk? Samantha. Since the meltdown of last December, the situation has steadily worsened. The recession has deepened, unemployment has risen, and deposit accounts remain frozen. On July 15th, Buenos Aires federal court decreed that the bank should return Dori Arias's family money. She has recovered about 60%. On July 24th, President Dualde decreed that court orders regarding deposits should not be carried out. Dori continues to fight for the rest of their money.
Wide Angle continues. Joseph Stiglitz, welcome to Wide Angle. Nice to be here. We've just seen a powerful film showing what amounts to a, a Great Depression in Argentina. Help us to understand the impact of this crisis in Argentina. Well, it's having an enormous impact in Latin America and, and throughout the developing world. If this is what happens to the A-plus student, the, the student who followed the advice of the IMF, the United States, if this is what happens, then many countries around the world are saying, we want no part of it. Polls have suggested uh, that now some two-thirds of the people in these Latin American countries that are going through this economic turmoil have turned against democracy as their preferred form of government. How troubled should we be in America? I think we should be very troubled. I mean, turmoil in, in our neighbors to the south uh, inevitably will, will cause problems for us. If only through migration and we have an enormous amount of familiar connections between Americans and people in Latin America. But I think more fundamentally, I think Americans are committed to democracy. And it is a concern to us when democracy fails and people perceive that democracy fails. And the problem is, one of the problems is that, that they've had democracies in which they've not had the ability to make choices over basic economic principles, economic systems. They were pushed down their throat by the U.S. Treasury by the IMF, and so these the international monetary fund, fund international monetary, and so they don't feel like these were their policies. Are you seriously suggesting that most of the blame for Argentina's ills, economic ills, is the fault of outsiders, or do you think there is a shared responsibility? Well, there's clearly a shared responsibility, but let me make it clear. I think it would have been almost impossible for anybody to have made the system of fixed exchange rates work in an environment in which the United States, they were linked to the United States. So they were linking their currency to making it equal to the dollar. That's right. And when the dollar went up relative to the euro and where their neighbor, Brazil's currency, went way down, they were put in a position where their currency was vastly overvalued. They couldn't sell their goods. So they couldn't export their products. They couldn't export their products. Their economic situation looked dismal. Anybody looking at, at the situation said, this can't continue. Seeing that, people began taking their money out of the country. Early on, the Bush administration suggested that Argentina might be isolated event. There wouldn't contaminate the financial markets throughout uh, Latin America. Do you think they were right or did they make a mistake? Oh, they clearly made a mistake. Uh, the economic downturn in Argentina has already spilled over to Uruguay, concerned about Paraguay, Brazil, but there's absolutely no doubt But there's a high level of instability. But here we have a situation where Argentina is in this Great Depression, where Brazil, its neighbor, is suffering as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about some solutions. I think the fundamental problem in, in these countries is trying to get their economy, in, in Argentina, is trying to get the economy started again. The IMF was originally created over 50 years ago under the intellectual aegis of, of Keynes. The uh, founder of modern economics. Founder of modern economics, and he was writing in the period of Great Depression. He said sometimes economies, market economies, don't work. And when they don't work, there's an important role for government. There's a role for government in trying to stimulate the economy, to get the engine restarted, a word that was used as prime the pump. And money that goes into the economy to help prime the pump would be helpful. And the United States, in our recession of 2001, both the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States said, we need a fiscal stimulus. We need to stimulate our economy. There was a disagreement about We need to spend money. We need to spend money, cut back taxes, do something. There's a federal government responsibility to help strengthen the economy. Yet in Argentina and other countries in Latin America, the IMF, which basically reflects the views of the United States because we, the United States has a veto power, the only country with a veto power. The IMF went into Argentina and said, you have to cut back your expenditures. 
in two years, they cut back expenditures on things other than interest by 10%. It only made the recession deeper. Should the IMF be helping to bail these countries out now? Money from the IMF that goes to repay money to the IMF or money to the World Bank or money to the Inter-American Development Bank to repay international creditors is not going to help restart the economy. What they need is access to markets. What they need is credit that will go into the firms working capital. So they can export their goods. So they can buy the inputs that produce the goods that they can export. Paul O'Neill, the Treasury Secretary, is visiting these countries this week, Brazil, Argentina, and others. Uh, what do you think his message should be, and how do you think they will be reacting to the policies of the U.S. Treasury Department? Well, I wish the policy were going to be a good neighbor policy, saying, look at Argentina, you are in trouble. How can we get your economy started? The way we can restart your economy is the way we helped Mexico restart in 1995. How do we do that? We bought their goods. You buy goods, you create jobs. So we, we should open our markets. We should Argentina. open up our markets. And that would be a real gesture of a good neighbor. So what's an example of that? Argentinian beef having no tariffs on that? Exactly. It's very good beef, by the way. <laughs> so American consumers would actually benefit from it. Argentinian wheat. Let's open up our markets. Mexico has done a deal with Argentina to try to buy some of the Argentinian cars. It would be great if the strongest country, the strongest economically, and one that preaches free markets actually practice what it preaches and open up our markets. Many have suggested the problem here is that when an American uh, company or an American individual gets deeply in debt, they can declare bankruptcy and go to Chapter 11. What there should be is more use of bankruptcy-type mechanisms. Uh, in the 19th century, when countries couldn't repay their debts, Germany, France sent their troops in to, to Mexico, for instance, and forced them to repay. Right. As recently as 1902, uh, Western troops were down in Venezuela. And uh, at that point, the, the foreign minister of Argentina made a speech about how inappropriate it was for foreign troops to come down to Latin America to force the payment of debt. We've gone beyond debtor prisons for private debts. We've gone beyond the use of military power for sovereign debts. But we really haven't gone to the next stage of having a bankruptcy proceeding. One of the things we are increasingly recognizing is that globalization has brought us, uh, which is the integration of the countries and peoples of the world, has increased our interdependence. As we become more interdependent, we have to find ways of handling common problems, of collective action, where we have common problems. Joe Stiglitz, thank you for joining us. <laughs>
I didn't learn that at church. I learned it in Washington. I learned it watching. Learn that at church. I learned it in Washington. I learned it watching Congress deal the cards while making legislation. This time, the loser is America's elderly. With the price of prescription drugs going up and up, politicians of both parties promise to help old people with the cost. But with a flourish of the old magic, now you see it, now you don't, senators last week killed the legislation and adjourned to their favorite pastime, raising money for re-election from pharmaceutical companies and other kindred souls. Buying all that influence in Congress is one reason drug costs go up. So is the money, two to three billion dollars a year, the companies spend trying to persuade us to buy their drugs. You know the ads in question. They keep telling us to ask your doctor about the wonders of some expensive new drug. Okay, we'll ask the doctor. We'll ask him for a second opinion about those ads. I'm Dr. Mark Siegel. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at New York Good University. Morning. Good to see you here. And a practicing internist since 1990. You feeling all right? In the past five years, there has been a disturbing change that affects the way that I work with my patients. Well, it starts Drug companies, America's most profitable industry, have inserted themselves as a filter between me and my patients, and they're doing it with advertising. Acid reflux disease can really upset your plans. All I want are nights with less pain. Mornings. These ads contain very healthy looking people, smiling, having a great time, and there's a cue there to the consumer. You'll be like this too if you take this medicine. Celebrate, come on and celebrate. And these ads put a lot of pressure on the patients to come right to their doctors and demand the medications. Go ahead, ask your doctor about all taste. Ask your doctor if Zocor could work for you. Hi, Hi. Dr. Siegel, how are you? Good, how are you? The doctor is under similar pressures because the drug salesmen come to the doctor's office. Usually diabetics create um, an overproduction of VLDL and, tr and Tricor reverses that. They come under a veil of information, but the information that they give is always skewered and it's always brought to me by someone that isn't particularly an expert in the field. Because it really reverses what's going yes. on with their lipids. Good to see you. And I'll give you some samples. They bring free lunches to the office. They wine and dine the staff. Your, your big sales point is that it's longer acting? It is a longer acting product and it's also in some cases, well, according to this study, a head to head to head with Losartan, Valsartan and Herbisartan, a diastolic cuff blood pressure, 145 patients in each sample group approximately. Today was my wife's birthday, so one of the drug reps brought in a cake for her. I can't, you know, I don't like the threats. Of course, bringing in that cake... Look, look how pretty that is. ...doesn't mean that I'm going to be prescribing his medication. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Right. Thanks for the time. Nice to see you. Hope you enjoyed everything. Okay. Yeah, it was great lunch. Thanks for bringing it. This is my drug closet. It's where all the samples get kept that the drug representatives bring by. It tends to be mostly stocked with new drugs or drugs that are trying to make a pitch at the market. So I look at this closet as...